What I'm really concerned about right now is the school experiences, the life experiences of black girls. We need to address the fact that the new face of intersectional erasure may be girls of color. It may be that the ways in which they're experiencing the workforce, the ways in which they're pushed out of school, the ways in which they're seen as being little women as opposed to girls is the new face of intersectional erasure. As most of the nation knows, so much attention has been given to black boys and men over the past you know, 20 years or so in education research. So it is refreshing that we are now seeing a, a rightful um, inclusion of, of black girls and, and women because they really are pushed out of schools in some uniquely gendered ways that haven't been you know, fully considered. I think black girls are, are seen as uh, either invisible or they're problematized, meaning there's, there's fault with them. They're looked at through a, a deficit lens, if you will. I think that many of the attributes that sustain them are, are not um, celebrated. They're too loud, they're too bossy, they're, they're just too much. African-American women played significant roles at all levels of the civil rights movement, yet too often they remain invisible to the larger public. This fancy magazine, you know, gave the credit for Black Lives, Ma Lives Matter to a guy. Oh, of give course. Him, give him the credit due him. That's right. But didn't mention the women at all who mm -hmm. started the, or this, uh, this whole movement. It's like a lot of people began to, to say it's happening already, you know, that the women are being erased. Black girls are misunderstood, misread. Um, a lot of their identities teachers do not understand. Or oftentimes, you know, they are, they are victims. And so I think if we're going to talk about, you know, the issues that are impacting our most vulnerable, it's black girls. And that hasn't been said. Yes, say it, Bettina. And everyone you've heard so far sharing their views on black girls and women. You just heard and saw Bettina Love, Sean Harper, and Terry Watson speaking as part of a YouTube Education Week commentary series on black girls, discipline, and schools by Education Week. You also heard Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw from a conference I attended a few years back. I was so excited. I recorded some of her speech to keep with me. And you also heard Dr. Janet Bell, who appeared on Black America with host Carol Jenkins for the episode called The Erasure of Black Women from History. As you've noticed, this is by far not your usual episode of Daily Border Crossings. There's visuals instead of just audio. There's a theme instead of an interview with one or two people. This episode is being devoted to uh, a project for a Harvard Graduate School of Education class called Say Her Name, Race, Gender, and Violence from Tichuba to Brianna Taylor. The class focused on black women and the leaders said we could do something um, as our final uh, thing to turn in something besides a traditional paper. Now, I like a challenge, even if it does keep me on the road less travel <laughs> or have me up at say 3 a.m. still working um, on the project. Part of that though is a combo effects of uh, a perfectionist and procrastinator personality. So, but let me not get caught up too much in, in personal uh, commentary. So what is this? That's a good question. Think of this as you might, um, what you might get if a research paper came to life. So what is a pod pain? That's also a good question, especially since you wouldn't know since I just made it up for this project. Now, let me pause for some self-care praise. Pod pain? Girl, look at you over there coining terms like Kimberly Crenshaw. Okay, I see you. Okay, so the... Pod Pain is essentially a podcast and campaign for hashtag us too, which I'll tell you about shortly. For the project, I will be exploring the juxtaposition of Black women being centered versus Black women being pushed to the margins and erased. I'll be exploring these two questions. 
How does centering the ways in which Black women live and love, survive and struggle for freedom point toward the liberation of all people? And how and why is it that Black women, a group of people so seemingly pivotal, uh, so crucial to the well-being of so many other groups in this country, of people whose skin is shades of brown, so it's impossible to not see, um, why and how is it that they have historically been and continue to be invisible to society. Think of it this way. Black women show up excited, ready to be centered, centering themselves at times, but often end up like this, dismissed, disregarded, distorted, repeatedly. The campaign piece for hashtag us too, you see here and there, I created it a few years back when, in my opinion, aspects of the Me Too movement were being co-opted and not considering or being inclusive of black women. In essence, erasing them. So the timing for it is perfect. Hashtag us too is a push for people to remember, respect and regard black women. As you can see in the last set of pictures, even the greats among us, people will try to diminish. Katherine Johnson sent a man to space and for about 80 years was erased. And by the way, have I mentioned how excited I am about this? Like I love creating, I'm super excited. Okay, so now that we've set the stage, let's look at where we're going. We'll look at some of these notable yet mostly erased women, primarily those involved in civil rights, so we can see who they were and what they did, what kinds of traits they had. A good number of them are still alive. Throughout this episode, I'll be arguing in favor of centering black women and arguing for a hashtag us too. So I'll be referencing readings from the class, as well as using some of those readings to guide conversations with my guests. What's the purpose of that? In referencing the readings, I'll be verbally citing my sources. Creative, right? I'm so excited. Speaking of excitement, I'm super excited about my guests. They are thought leaders. There's esteemed law professor Echo Yanka, who practices and teaches law with a moral perspective in mind academic technology coordinator and diversity, equity, and inclusion enthusiast, Jonathan Fichter, the Reverend Jennifer Gamper of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, who's done extensive race work through a faith-based lens in and outside of the church, and Harvard med student, Lashira Lash Nolan, whose medical work is at the intersection of race and underserved slash marginalized communities. Lash is the first black woman class president that Harvard Medical School has had. This sis is doing big things. And it's no surprise, she has the best spirit. This is someone who's trying to be a doctor, who's super concerned about marginalized communities. Can you imagine being one of her patients? Honest, fun, sincere, caring, passionate, and brilliant. After those guests, two of whom are black and two of whom are white, what are people who are not black or white thinking about black women? How do they feel? I gather up some fellow grad students who are people of color, though not black or not fully black. Wait till you hear their powerful perspectives and thoughts on this matter. After exploring today's questions with my guests, I'll consider what's been learned from all the exploring and then begin the wrap up. So good day, good people. So glad you're with me on this exciting journey on black women. So when I think of terms like these, leader, publisher, chief strategist, lecturer, Army information specialist, professor of law, board chairman, author. I think of men. I could do some self-reflecting to figure out why exactly that is, but immediately I think it's because of who society inherently centers and the sorts of roles and titles they have. Now, consider these roles as descriptors of Black people, okay? Black women in particular, Dr. Janet Bell, author of Lighting the Fires of Freedom, African-American Women in the Civil Rights Movement, talks to Black America host Carol Jenkins about a number of these women. Merle Evers, I asked her how she coped when her husband was killed essentially in front of her and her children. And she told me that she played it out in her mind because she knew it was that the times were dangerous. What would happen if? It was not that she was fearless. She knew how to cope with fear. And Merle Evers, after she stayed in that house for a year and a half or so and then realized that she needed to take her three children to California, where she went, where she went back to school and got and earned her own degree. She is a woman who absolutely 
uh, knows how to work in partnership, knows how to stand on her own, and she is so supportive of the black community. So she's, to me, she, she is my single biggest role model. But continue to be, to be uh, active in the NAACP and... Uh... And not totally appreciated. Her, right. her leadership was supported by her then husband or her second husband. The, the organization has evolved somewhat but not entirely. Yes. So Merle Ever, in some ways, it's just, she's a little prickly sometimes, and I love that because she says, and some of the other women also intimated, we're not muse museum pieces, we are real people. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I think to know their full complexities is really even more important to know their, than to know their iconic status. Right, well, Kathleen Cleaver, I oh, told I you. Oh, I love her. I know, so do I. I met her for the first time recently, but certainly had covered her as a reporter when she was with the Black Panthers. Now she's a grandmother and is teaching, as she's a law professor. Uh, and uh, as we all, we sat there and talked about our grandchildren, I thought, what an arc of, you know, how, how times have changed. <laughs> on the run from the FBI, oh right gosh. on the most wanted right. list. But she came back, she graduated, undergraduate, summa cum laude. Yes. Uh, she, she clerked for Brilliant. Judge Leon Higginbottom. Brilliant. She's one of the smartest people ever. And she just, she still has that fire in, in her. But Kathleen had the, besides her own, wonderful brilliance and her own sense of um, sense of self she has a sense of adventure she also ha she's really has self-knowledge in the sense that she knows how valuable she is mm. to this world and she's also dedicated to her grandchildren <laughs> what about diane nash but diane nash was played in the movie selma mm -hmm. and speaking of how the erasure of women from history. They had this pretty uh, actress playing Diane Nash, who's still gorgeous and 70 something, right? And this young woman in the film is sitting on a desk and she's listening to the guys planning oh, right, the march and right. stuff like that. And I'm sitting. That was, made me a little. <laughs> I was in the theater and I'm trying to hold myself down right. and not scream. I thought, this woman is a strategist. Right. She was the leader of the Nashville student movement. Why are, have they diminished her so? And I've asked other people if they noticed her in the film and they remember this pretty woman on the desk, but they didn't know the history of Diane Nash. Before the, the Freedom Ride, she had, her, she had everybody decide, make out wills because it was that dangerous. And so when, when, this, when the government, the United States government, tried to talk the students out of doing the Freedom Ride. She said, you don't understand. We made our wills out last week. We're ready. Wow. Okay, now Gloria Richardson. Gloria Richardson of the Cambridge Movement in Maryland was considered, I think Jet Magazine called her the Lady General of the Civil Rights Movement because she was one of the first people who said, I'm not quite sure about this nonviolent thing. And uh, she was, that was quite controversial, not only within the movement, but outside of the movement. And there's this great picture of her with uh, the National Guard having their rifles like that, and she's face to face. She was just astounded that anyone would point a gun at her, and she just refused to turn away. Another movie. <laughs> yeah, and she's still alive. She right? left Cambridge, Maryland. She came up to New York. She was working in the, the social workers uh, union, Local 371. She's a, a labor person. Fascinating, right? Like. Most of us might not have heard of a number of them, and they were so instrumental to the civil rights movement where we hear a lot about um, the men. So there's Gay McDougal, who you see here, who helped organize anti-apartheid uh, movement. Um, she has had an integral role with human rights with the UN for over 30 years. Um, first UN independent expert on minority issues, professor of law. Um, we have Leah Chase, so she was a chef, and I've heard it talked about before how women do most of the cooking, yet most of the chefs are men. What's that about? So Leah Chase um, was, a, um, she passed away um, not too long ago, but she was a, a New Orleans icon. They called her the queen of Creole cuisine, and she owned Dookie Chase's uh, restaurant. That was her husband. They owned it together. When he passed away, she kept going. She was still cooking in her 90s. She cooked there for 70 years. What she did with the movement was she defied segregation laws. 
she took the risk of allowing people to um, meet at their uh, restaurant to let that be the meeting place for activists and civil rights leaders, which was actually against the law at that time. So I'll read her quote, I was just feeding people. They were fighting for something. They didn't know what they would find when they went out there. They didn't know what would happen to them on the streets. But when they were here, they knew I'd feed them. That's what I could do for them. Okay, so that's another legend. And you have Daisy Bates, who was head of the NAACP in Little Rock. I feel like most of the NAACP heads were men. But here's somebody. She was also a publisher. She owned a newspaper, um, a journalist, a lecturer. And then Elizabeth Egfert. Uh, This picture is so striking. If you see the woman right behind her or all those people, can you just imagine? It's almost like, what? Did you really not have anything better to do than just follow this woman? She actually said that later she had um, issues with public spaces with large crowds. How could she not? The woman right behind her looks uh, quite evil, the face that she's making, and they're screaming at her. She was a teenager, one of the Little Rock Nine, and so she's just a young child here trying to go to to school, but she became an activist, and she too became a journalist and an army information specialist and a military reporter. So Elizabeth Eckford, who I, I did not know, Joanne Robinson, so much of the Montgomery boycott, we only hear about Martin Luther King um, and Rosa Parks, right? She, before both of them, um, she had this idea that there should be a boycott. She did not like how she was treated on the bus. She did not like where she had to sit. She even wrote a letter to the mayor threatening that they would do this like over a year before it even happened. So she was a lead strategist and she worked for um, the Alabama Women's Political Council. She was a part of the organization at first, and the leadership was not interested in hearing her points about a boycott. They didn't think any such thing was possible, but she ended up becoming the president and she got right to work working on it. And so she helped. She was quite instrumental. In fact, Dr. King mentioned her um, in his book. Um, He said regarding the boycott, apparently indefatigable, she, uh, Joanne Robinson, Robinson, perhaps, more than any other person was active on every level of protest. And a quote from her, women's leadership was no less important to the development of the Montgomery bus boycott than was the male and minister dominated leadership. All right. And the last person I want to talk to you about is Polly Murray. Uh, myself and some colleagues, um, some fellow students were quite disappointed that we were never taught about her. Polly Murray was way ahead of her time. She actually wrote the law paper, Thurgood Marshall called it his law Bible. She wrote it. It's like this 700 page thing um, that he used to argue Brown versus Board of Education. Did not even tell her, did not tell her uh, that he was using that, but he knew that that was how good it was. She went to Howard Law School. She was the only woman dominated by men. She was not treated so well. They expected her to not last, but she not only did she last, she graduated ahead of the class. She beat all of them out with with her grades and her study ethics. Um, And she effectively overturned Plessy. When she had this idea, you know, she's like, everybody's focusing on the the separate but equal part of the equal. Let's make things equal. She's like, but what if things weren't separate? And they laughed at her. They were like, this is the way it is. It's always going to be this way. She dreamed bigger. And she bet that 25 years from that time, things would be different. And they took the bet. And guess what? In 10 years from when she made the bet, um, Brown versus Board of Education happened, which, uh, as we know, ended uh, segregation in schools. But she also was the first African-American woman ordained uh, an Episcopal priest, the first to earn a JSD degree from Yale Law School, a founder of the National Organization for Women. She had a uh, a close relationship with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. She was quite um, a pioneer. And she even orchestrated sit-ins, right, and and refused to get off the bus and got arrested two decades before the civil rights movement. So Polly Murray is, is somebody to know. So these are the sorts of people that, uh, that women whose names end up erased or dismissed. Why? You know, I wondered why with people as great as this, if these were men, I'm sure we would have heard about them. These are leaders, bona fide leaders. And so I wondered, why might that be? The most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected uh, person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. Ouch. Thanks for that reminder, Brother Malcolm. I feel that. So let's look at some readings from the class to think about why this might be. 
Could it be because if we think about Andrea Smith's sexual violence as a tool of genocide, she talks about slave rape, essentially, she says, and because black women were seen as the property of their slave owners, their rape at the hands of these men did not count. As one Southern politician declared in the early 20th century, there's no such thing as a virtuous colored girl over the age of 14. These sorts of things stick in our psyche, and I wonder if this contributes to why we're so disrespected, neglected, erased. Another idea comes from Mariam Akaba's foreword in Andrea Ritchie's Invisible No More, Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color, she writes... The death of women in police custody by means of law enforcement's measures to discipline and punish is an issue rarely raised in feminist explorations of women and violence or masculinist explorations of racism and policing. By centering the experiences of girls and young women of color, Invisible No More extends and enlarges the carceral landscape, insisting that we consider the streets, the schools, and the home as sites of oppressive policing. Invisible No More argues that paying attention to these issues expands and transforms how we consider policing. So the police are supposed to protect us right but when they're harming us does that consider making us look like people worthy to be harmed is it perhaps massage noir dr moya bailey created this portmanteau a portmanteau is a word blending the sounds and combining the meanings of two others like motel and brunch you know that means wait that means pod pain is a portmanteau i created one too woo woo Listen, I'm doing big things over here, okay? Just saying. So Dr. Bailey defines massage noir as the specific combination of anti-black and misogynistic representation in visual culture and digital spaces that shapes broader ideas about black women. So it's a combination of misogyny, sort of hatred of women, noir, French for black. She gives some examples. When black girls are expected to avoid predators while white girls are expected to be protected from them, that's massage noir. When a juror says in Surviving R. Kelly that he didn't like how Kelly's accusers were dressed during his 2000 a trial and therefore didn't believe their testimony that's massage noir i bet that adds to why they are erased lastly this idea of us as props in patricia hill collins on intellectual activism's chapter on black feminist thought she does a really interesting analogy on thinking about watching a play there's a star typically a young blonde attractive virile white american male and all these people and all the stage hands and extras are props that are just there for the sole purpose of propping up the star they get no lines their lives aren't thought of they're just collecting dust when they are not helping prop up the star regardless of their appearance or function we only see or hear from those props via their roles in the star's story so that's another reason to consider about why we are erased now another exciting part where i get to do research by the opportunity to dig deeper by interviewing my special guests when i saw law professor echo yanka's moving piece on PBS NewsHour comparing the unjust treatment of the opioid crisis with that of the crack epidemic. I knew he was somebody I wanted to talk to. I had a feeling he would have compelling moral perspectives. I was right. He did not disappoint and neither do the others. They kept blowing and opening my mind. I'm getting excited just thinking about it. Wait until you hear their perspectives and their compelling reasons for the need to center black women. Hashtag us too. With Professor Echo Yanka. Um, It specifically focuses on black women, exploring the complexities of black women and the nuances. This group that, in my opinion, shows up at the center or tries to, but gets pushed to the margins or erased. There are so many, I'm always learning some new name of a person who did this extraordinary thing in history that I never knew because I, you know, you hear about Rosa Parks, you hear about Harriet Tubman, but there's so many um, that, that did other things. And so with that in mind, um, I want to ask your thoughts. Do, do you have thoughts on, on, the roles of black women or how they, um, how black women get to show up or don't get to show up in, in um, not even just in history, I guess like the erasure piece, like what, what do you see? Um, so I, I, when you emailed me the question, I, I thought it was such a terrific question. And I wish I was, um, I wish I was more expert in the particular subject. So I won't pretend that I'm a historian. I will say, um, you know, there is something, arrogance not quite the right word. There's something cruel and um, unjustified in the way that we constantly think of black women as able to save the day when America needs her, um, but to be ignored otherwise, right? I mean, the most topical moment of this currently has been, you know, every liberal and frankly, even a wider swath of people, not just liberals, praising the role of black women in the in the most recent election right that this core group 
of uh, voters are the ones who have brought America back to sanity. Um, but then when black women made demands on an administration or during the election, right, there's a conversation, well, how much should the Democratic Party become radical? How much should they listen to, you know, there's this sort of sense, well, no, of course we expect you to save us when, when the chips are down. But then when you demand the same things that every, every voting bloc demands, right? right. Um, yes. Somehow it seems as extraordinary or extreme. Nobody thinks it's extreme. Indeed, there's been a whole four year, um, I'll use the word elegy now, um, about how working class white men need to be served better by politics. And I think a lot of that is right. But why is it that when black women say the same thing, it's, you know, the, the question is this, how radical should the party get? As though somehow those demands are radical in a way that's different than, than working class white men. Um, but sorry, that's just the most immediate and topical. What I really thought when I got your email is that you're absolutely right. And one of the things that people need to learn more or notice more is that whenever America has tended to the most vulnerable people, it has always been to the benefit of everybody, right? I mean, and this is clearly the case with Black women. So the fight that Black women had um, during both... Um, the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment, the question about um, uh, uh, Black enfranchisement first, and then after that, the, um, uh, the right of women to vote, the enfranchisement of women in the 19th Amendment. That had a constant thread of the question of how will Black women and when will Black women be allowed to vote? And the fractures that came to be when at first the question was all Negroes should vote, and that meant Negroes would be granted the vote along with women. And finally, a kind of political um, uh, deal or betrayal that, well, if we ignored the black, if we ignore the women question, right, then, then black men can get the vote and we'll just set aside the question um, of, of suffrage for women for the moment. Um, and of course we see now, you know, years, decades later when black women joined with women to vote, that our democracy not just became better, but so much more sane. I mean, so many of the things we count out as political advancements in the last century have in part been because women could vote. When you think of the way in which we tried to support the elderly and social security, right? Um, again, my point here is not just about black women, though it is in hugely impacted by black women. The point is when we thought hard about how to deal with chronic poverty among the elderly. Yeah. We built a system that was supposed to take care of the most vulnerable of us. And it has joined us with the civilized world in having a way to work and retire with dignity. It's a hard way. It's a complicated thing. We have to fight for social security. We have to fund it right. Uh, we have to think of the benefits and trade-offs. I don't pretend to have those answers. But the point is, without this impulse to take care of the most vulnerable among us, right? people still wouldn't have social security in this country, mm. right? And, and that is because we focused on those who had been othered so long. The last and most obvious example, let me just throw one last one out there. Um, you know, affirmative action was this question about how black men and women, but also black women would be more highly integrated into our workforce. And I could state the obvious that when the best people are allowed to flourish, the whole country does better. The fact that you're at uh, Harvard getting your master's degree in teaching will mean another teacher out there with new skills, new ways to guide. And by the way, a vision that's impacted by her being a black woman who can reach back and help black girls flourish, but also those white girls flourish and those white boys yes. flourish. Yep. All true. But the most obvious example is when we put affirmative action into place and when we built on, on programs that had that as a, its legacy, the people who flourished the most were white women, right? White women who were already in a position of huge, uh, well, you know, the thing that was holding white women back was that they were women. And so we put affirmative action in place and they exploded onto the workforce exactly. much to the betterment of our whole country. Um, that's not to say that I think we should use black women as an instrument to the good of others. That's not at all my point. My point though is we have learned over and over and over when we listen to the voice of those among us 
who have been most vulnerable, who have been most roughly treated, who have been most ignored, and we listen to their moral demands, it is not a surprise that we make the country better for everybody. I'm going to ignore the more intimate examples. Look, if we see a mother who's struggling to give her kids health care, I mean, the grand examples are meant to touch on the intimate ones. If we see a mother who's struggling to give her kids health care, we notice that Black women are often struggling to do that, and we provide for that. How do we not think that will make our country better, right? I mean, if every woman who's struggling to give her kid health care, that will mean that Black women will give their Black children better health care. That'll mean that the white woman who's struggling to give her kid health care will find that program and give her kid better health care. And on, if we find that um, mothers find that they're not succeeding uh, because they can't balance the huge demands at home and the demands at work, and we build better infrastructure for, uh, for child care, We've seen in country after country, in Europe most in particular, that the better health care and the better child, uh, child welfare and child care you have for women, the better your economy goes, the better women can succeed, the heights of power and the glass ceilings they can finally burst, and the better it is for the whole country. So I was speaking in these grand historical abstractions, but I also want us to focus on the way these intimate little stories tell us that the that our future will be better if we center those whose voices have been most urgently ignored, right? Black women in particular. You know, I was reading uh, different things that um, this throughout the semester in this course, um, there's one author and I can't remember if it's Smith or Ritchie who talked about all these ways and that, that even you, you mentioned that women um, have gotten more rights. Um, speaking, thinking about women and violence or domestic violence, there's all these laws, there's these things that, that positive achievements that were happening. And then she goes on to say though, that it ended up being uh, a white women um, mostly, or the, the popular culture women, because they didn't separate by race and gender. So there started being things that, you know, th they weren't looking at the specifics and then women of color, black women and women of color were just looked at as racial um, and they weren't necessarily benefiting from some, some of these adventures. So there's one thing. And then Bell Hooks is reading her um, in her book, what was it called? Um, the Will to Change, Men, Masculinity, and Love. There's a chapter called Understanding Patriarchy. And she talks about how she and her brother were little and she liked to play marbles. He didn't, but marbles was a boy's game. And her father would, would be livid about how much into it she was and he wasn't and he to the extent that she ultimately wouldn't stop after he told her to and she ended up getting a spanking and just like couldn't play marbles anymore because this is a boys thing you have to learn that what girls do and roll so i wonder um if you have any thoughts on um why uh like why they black women um this is it's, it's also interesting because you can't not see black women <laughs> like it's funny that that um you know we're so often invisible like you gotta see us but um is it patriarchy? Is it the dominant culture stuff? Or is it just, I don't know, just any thoughts you had about why this group is um, necessary, but so often erased and invisible? Yeah, it, it is a really hard question. I mean, I do think you've touched upon, um, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw's important work on intersectionality recalls yeah. what you said. You know, the, the sort of question, the, the, her point, her now classic point is that our different identities, uh, our different identities react with power in different ways, right? So it is just not the case that um, white men and white women have the same set of interactions in the world. It's also not the case that black men and black women have the same uh, set of interactions, in the world, right? There are ways in which you and I will have experiences that are the same and they'll, they'll be defined by the color of our skin. There'll be ways in which you have experiences that are different than mine. They'll be defined by your gender or your sex and, and I'll, treated as a man in certain ways or be treated as a woman. And there'll be ways in which you'll have experiences that are about being a black woman, right? That are different than white women. Um, and so, you know, and by the way, you know, nobody denies that there's also the complexity that all our identities then jostle for attention in the kind of unique thing that is you, right? That That is, you know, indefinable by just any particular character trait. Um, but I do think the point about intersectionality is in America, race has been such a volatile, straining, deflating, and um, fractious problem for so long that I think it became very easy for when conversations turned to race 
to think about the things that black men needed, right? Um, and especially because we lived in a society for so long where men were the bread earners, right? Um, you know, so you know, as you know, uh, probably better than I do, even in our history, there were long moments where um, the most August voices of the black intelligentsia said, the most important thing right now is for the black man to have a job so he can support himself and have pride. And that will build the race up before we need to worry about women. Um, and that was, as you point out, just about the way in which men and women were viewed. It was about patriarchy. Um, so, so I do think the kind of dominance of how men needed to provide and become equal meant that to the extent we thought about race, we often thought about black men. That's also amplified, I think, by the fact that criminal law has so uh, brutalized the black community and criminal law obviously focuses on men um, so much more. Um, and so that there's a sadness that too often in America, when people think about crime, they, they think about race. When they think about race, they think about crime. And that has all been, again, male-centered. Um, so I, those aren't great those aren't perfect answers, but I think those are among the reasons why the sort of toil of black women holding together families and communities and frankly, sometimes a nation have been easy to take for granted. I wouldn't say ignore, just taken for granted is, is in a way different and maybe worse than being ignored. I don't know. I don't know if they're exactly the same thing. I'd have to think about it. I like the taken for granted expression not that that's a good thing but i like that because I, when when i was reflecting on this i was like clearly i knew that we are not um promoted or or centered or but i didn't think much about why or like what could do not as much as i have been lately that i've been you know intentionally thinking about it and so maybe it is like a, sort of a taken for granted sort of thing um this has been super helpful. Thank you so much um, for your time. I, I think I've, I've been socialized. I, I think I've been trained not to notice black women for for most of my life um you know growing up in a in a predominantly white suburb of philadelphia um i i watched a lot of leaders including in school a lot of teachers i only had one teacher who was a black woman uh that, that was not until until uh high school and uh, that teacher it was her first year there so i have to looking back i have to imagine she was under a lot of pressure to probably to stay in her lane. And um, I don't think I, other than fiction and poetry, I don't think I ever read anything written by a black woman until college. Um, so, you know, and this is Phil, looking back now, you know, when I was in high school, you know, Angela Davis was, was speaking at a really important convention in Philadelphia. I could have been there in person. Um, I had no idea it was happening, just not even on my radar. Wow. I think a lot of things in the suburb where I grew up were based on maintaining the status quo, right? And um, I, if we really listened to the voices of, of Black women, we would need to change a lot of things. Mm. Um, the, the more I, I think about it and the more I get ready, the more I realize how wonderful those changes would be. Right, right, right. right. And at the same time, I, I know that any kind of change, you know, any kind of change can be, can be a little bit scary. Right. And I think maybe it's that fear that makes it hard to listen. You know, I, I'm glad I know you because <laughs> there's, there's this one thinking move that you've given me that I think really helps here. Because as 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 a as a white man, you know, cisgender, heterosexual, documented, employed, homeowner, um, sometimes it's it's hard for 
for me to see how liberation when it comes to race you know you know how that could liberate me as well you know in a lot of ways things are looking pretty good at the same time by by listening to black women i can see how important it is to change and to be part of change and to work towards liberation you always tell me when it gets hard to see something about race just flip it and make it about gender and and that's what works for me i was just having this conversation with someone else a week ago right so i mean as a man i clearly have advantages but it's also a little bit easier for me to see how how sexism and and the patriarchy cause me pain too and and a lot of men i've talked with they, they have stories about you know being boys growing up and and getting some kind of really painful message about well if you want to be a man you have to give that up or or cut that part of yourself off or 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 silence this voice inside yourself so many stories like that and i have plenty of it but then thanks to people like bell hooks and and you when you listen to black women they can talk about that and then they can help to make those similar connections to race as well so so i can feel how gender liberation could could really be freeing for me in terms of you know so many men experience including myself experience loneliness and you know we might have activity bros but do we really have friends there, there's a lot there and then if we listen to black women we can turn to race as well and we can think about how how whiteness and white supremacy it it may give us a couple things but it really robs us of of, of the world that we want to live in you know like i live in a city on purpose but right now i can't enjoy so many parts of that city because racism says some people are disposable we don't have to care about them well guess what that kind of thinking is what allows a pandemic to spread that kind of thinking is now why i cannot enjoy this beautiful city that i live in right so if i want to be part of if i want to live in the kind of world that that i really think we all deserve to be in you know i need everyone to feel heard i need everyone to be valued i need everyone to be free and and listening to black women's voices that's how we're going to get there thank you for lending your voice to this uh i really appreciate it and i appreciate your time oh thanks so i am so honored to have with me um on the show uh the reverend jennifer gamber reverend When we um, decenter uh, Black women, we fail to see and recognize, name, and celebrate, and honor, and learn from the variety of ways of what it means to be human, and the resiliency and the grit of 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 Black women that that I can learn from, that I can use as models to say. Um, to, to name the strengths of others and say, is that a strength that I can find in myself as well? Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to erase those or not even recognize those experiences, I'm denying myself their witness to me and my own fullness of life, right? Right. In a very selfish way. I think the other, and again, this is another selfish reason, but I also have been talking to a friend who said, who said until white people realize that, that, um, anti-racism benefit until they realize that their anti-racism work benefits them that white people won't do it to it the fullest account and I, that's probably true we are all selfish people unfortunately yes well of- not yes yes to the selfish part but um yes that's a great point i think a lot of people um uh, white people doing anti-racism work see see it as a benefit for black people or people of color but it is a whole, um, a whole different mindset to think of it as benefiting them also. That's a really good point. So, so erasing either the experiences or the parts of the lies or flattening the lies of others to a caricature means that I can't, they're, I'm keeping them from being fully available to a relationship that I could have with them. So that means I myself am not 
flourishing in my own life because I have limited the world in which I live and move and have my being. Um, and that's a deficit life. That's a life mm. that's not flourishing for me and it's not flourishing for others. So why does erasure happen? Yes. I do think that there is a significant generational shame in the United States when it comes to having enslaved people and the continued oppression exploitation of others. I wouldn't say that it's something that we can necessarily name, but there's a trauma. I think that it happens to the opp oppressor and the oppressed and we carry that in our bodies. And I think the erasure of that is sort of like you can't face what you have done to others. So you try to obliterate them. Mm. I don't think that that's conscious, conscious at all. I think it's deeply seated in who we are. I, I appreciate until, that. Um, the last thing I wanted to just get your thoughts on, we've had to do several readings this semester and one of them is called, but from the book, Push Out, The Criminalization of Black Girls in Schools by Monique Morris. And there's a chapter, chapter three, Jezebel in the classroom. And it talks about these girls who are like high school age, but they end up doing sex work. Um, essentially, they are missing dates from school. There's these guys who are much older who act like boyfriends to them only to get them in these relationships where then they have them sort of sell themselves to other people um, so that the men can ultimately make money. And this is happening in this example was um, some different cities in California in this book. And so these girls are missing days from schools and there's like these truancy sorts of things and, and people aren't really checking. Um, they are seen as promiscuous um, administrators and teachers are just seeing, you know, they're, they're getting in trouble for missing days and people are totally missing that this whole sort of prostitution type thing is happening with them. Um, and then they end up in the legal system and, and, and all these things are happening. Pointed out that there wasn't so much mentioned about um, the men in the story, um, people looking at them as the bad guys as much as they were looking at the girls as being promiscuous and such. And, and that was, for me, that's just like another way to end up sort of erased. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. Um, I think in those instances, what's being erased is the understanding and the recognition and it is the recognition because it's a, it's a true reality um, that these girls are, are made in the image of God and beautiful and full of potential. And what's happening is instead they're being objectified. They're seeing as instruments to the benefit of others. And, you know, I've seen in some of my own work that this objectifying of black girls happening you know, very, very young, um, that their bodies are considered instruments of, of whoever's in power. Right, and, right. Like they're little women, right? Not little girls, little women. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Um, that they are, um, and I, the, the two instances when they're, I've seen instances where they're quite young, um, maybe seven or eight, you know, considered to be caregivers for babies. Mm. And so they miss school because of that. Um, and so already, and, and, and this would be by, um, not necessarily by men, but I mean, by women themselves. So it's internalized oppression. It's an internalization of who, who they are. Or, um, and then as they, and then the, you pair that up with the sexualization of black girls, then that it further objectifies them and narrows that instrumentality, right? to a particular function, which is serving the needs of, of men. And, right. and so instead of, so it's so easy to erase that beneath that, that looking them at them at, as objects, they actually are subjects in their lives. Hmm. Seeking to be, to speak, right? Their right. souls are really wanting to speak. And it really is a school district's responsibility to see them as subjects of their lives as authors of their lives and to see that they're that 
there are forces that are objectifying them and, and push beyond those and get, get down to the reasons why, yeah, how, how they're in the situations that they're, they're in. And if you don't, and so that's not, see, you, you, what's happening there is by not reaching out to the fullness of the experience that they're having, they're erasing these girls as subjects and not doing the work, what schools should be doing is empowering their, their authorship, right? Yeah, I like that, the author, their authorship, right, of their, their own stories. What can be different? Like what, what, how do people start? How does this change? <laughs> it's a loaded question, but is it about, do you think it's about like seeing the humanity more somehow? I don't know. I do, I think, well, you know that I'm, so um, I believe in God. <laughs> yep. I, I believe that God cared so deeply that God sent God's son in the person of Jesus. And we all know that God chose that, that, that the word, that, that the word be birthed through a young girl and mm. she authorship over her life. And in fact, today was the reading of the Magnificat in Luke, where she proclaims that this word that has come to be dwelling with, with us in the person of Jesus was going to upend all sorts of structures, right? And um, was going to bring justice to this world. And so, I, I mean, as a person of faith, I think that, that it begins with reminding ourselves that we are children of God and that every person we meet is likewise a child of God. And we are called through our very central being if we do anything in life to bring the fullness of each other to fruition. Reverend Gamer, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, it's a blessing to know you, Samantha. And I, I mean, I've learned so much from you. I'm, I benefit tremendously from our friendship and, and through your work. And thank you for your voice. Yes. Lashira Flash. Yes. Lashira. You can, I mean, I always say Lashira. My name is Lashira, but my friends call me Lash. So. Got it. Got yep. it. Got it. So we're looking at what happens to black women and um, mm. and death or just the violence that that um, happens to black women or just like the struggle and and stuff. And so for the project, we all had to do some something to explore um, something that we've learned through this semester. So it was a great class. Like when I saw that, um, when I was signing up for classes in September, I'm like, wait, what? This is at Harvard. I'm going to study black women at Harvard. Like, I could not not take this again. What? It has nothing to do with my education major, except that it does kind of. So, um, so That's I took amazing. it. And so, so because I have, so my podcast is called daily border crossings. And I started that, um, this summer has been in my brain for like a couple of years, but, um, I worked before I came here in the independent school settings as a teacher, um, and I, um, I did that for like literally 11 years. Like I left the summer, I was like, I'm done. But what happens in independent schools is I think a lot of people think, you know, the people there are rich, they don't have no problems. But if you are a person of color as a student or a teacher, it's a lot of damaging stuff that happens. Um, a lot of traumatizing um, situations because there's all this equity and diversity, um, this mission statement and this, you know, this talk, but you know, I remember interviewing a group of girls who were in the seventh and eighth grade a few years back and it like touched me um, because they all seemed fine. These were all black girls, one Hispanic girl, and they all seemed fine, but like there were tears. I mean, they were just talking a lot about what life had been like to be there every day since like second grade and third grade and, and um, just this treatment that goes unnoticed. And so that's my interest, but also the teachers. Um, there's not a lot of us. And so you're unheard and you know, all this. And so I started holding these, well, first I revamped my curriculum for preschool and kindergarten. So like they started learning about race. Like by the time you left my classroom, white, whoever you are, you're going to know about black people. You're going to know about white people. Like you're going to be very comfortable talking about race at, at, at the kindergarten level. Um, and so then I started holding these workshops to teach other teachers how to be inclusive. And when I would be there, I would have 
other like teachers of color that would come to me to talk to me about hardships or having other schools. So all these adults that have So that was a part of also why I wanted to start this um, podcast, right? So it's daily border crossings and it's about othering. It's about feeling like when you show up at a space, you can't bring your whole self, like you cross a border to be there um, mm. today. So in addition, so that's one thing. So that ties into the class because you could do a paper, but I don't want to, people who know me like I can't just do anything regular I just don't it's just not like I, I gotta be extra. Your DNA. So I, I love it you right? different like, yeah exactly <laughs> I'll be up all night whatever you know it's do Wednesday by five I'll get it together so one of the readings that we did we did a lot of really good ones but one of them that I was going to bring up to you was uh my grandmother's hands have you been hearing about it it's all over the place res momenicum <laughs> You haven't heard that no, name? No, no, I haven't. Really? I'm surprised. I thought because he's yeah. medical, um, but you will, after this, you'll probably Google him and know he's like all over the place right now. It's a black man. The book is called My Grandmother's Hands and mm. My Grandmother's Hands, Racialized Trauma and the Pathway to Mending Our Hearts and Bodies. So his whole thing is on how we've passed down white people and black people, how this racism, the trauma is in our DNA at this point. Like it's, mm. it's, um, all this uh, things that are happening to our bodies um, because of what, because of history, because of all the years and histories of this. Um, if you don't have time to read, I don't know when you'll get a chance to read his book, but if you Google his um, NPR thing and just listen to that interview, like that'll be a good way to get an idea of who he is. In his, what chapter is this? Assaulting the Black Heart. So he talks about how sometimes um, one of the most damaging things he said about like that happens to black people um, or it's the least visible is that it goes to which goes to our point about in, in invisibility our assaults on black hearts um, is the ongoing lack of human regard for black people so he named some of that as like not listening or paying attention to someone or outright ignoring them as if black bodies were invisible interrupting or talking over black people not taking them seriously or saying stuff like you don't really mean that or how do you know you know stuff like that um, mm -hmm. so he's naming all these things that I feel like I see and I'd like to get your thoughts on on invisibility and I mean I know I've seen that where people just feel like do you, do you not hear us do you not see us yeah. um, so what are, what are some thoughts you have on that yeah no well first off I'm definitely gonna have to check him out I was like I'm already following him on Twitter I was creeping on him as you were speaking <laughs> because he sounds like an amazing human and yep. 100%. I think that that is so valid what he's speaking on. And like really the, the way that I think about it, it's just straight up like gaslighting. And I think it happens all the time as a, as a black student who is pushing for institutional change. Like you're, you're saying, you're saying this, this is my experience, right? Like I'm, I'm dealing with microaggressions in the clinical setting and you've then erected a, um, microaggressions task force that you'd like me to serve on and you're not going to provide me with any form of compensation or you're not going to provide me with any form Tell of my friend. showing that that you appreciate my efforts so then when it comes time for me to apply for residency right because that's the next step after medical school yes. I'm not going to have anything to show for it and then the, the process continues on and on again like as people are trying to get professorships in medicine so it's like they want us to do the work to save ourselves because they know we're going to do it because our survival depends on it yep. and then once we get there, they're going to be like, well, why don't you have any research? Well, because I've been serving on these, on these task forces, right? Yes. And I think that that's where the invisibility really starts to show. And, and I think also it shows itself when you look at how many Black physicians are at Harvard Medical and in, in the system, and there just aren't a lot of us, you know? Mm. At Dana-Farber Cancer Center, there's literally, I think, three Black physicians in the entire cancer center. What? And a lot of that is because folks don't feel like they are being seen, so they go elsewhere. But then the challenge of that is then as a, as a young Black student coming up, my experience feels that much more invisible because I don't see a lot of me around, right? So when I do experience that microaggression, there isn't a person here that I can really depend and lean on. And luckily I've been blessed to have mentors who really have my back, who both look and don't look like me. But I think that those experiences are really amplified in these spaces. And I just finished reading Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. And she, and she quotes this study that showed that like the, the more you 
have, the more you interface with the caste system as a reminder of where you are in the caste system, like for example, even though I'm here getting my MD and in my mind, I can start to think that I'm moving on up and I'm gonna be accepted by the upper caste, which she yep. identifies as white folks. It's that constant reminder is gonna have more detriment on my health. So mm. she was saying that those who are middle income and interface with that realization more frequently are more likely to have worse health outcomes like hypertension, chronic diseases, et cetera, because it causes more stress, um, which was Wait, really, yeah. Let me get that. Wait, uh -huh. <laughs> interact with, or we were thinking about, say that one more time. Then. So in our minds, we would think, okay, a person, a person like a black person who is low income, yeah. right? Because they're unable to have access to different resources, um, health insurance, access to healthcare, et cetera, they would be more at risk of having worse health outcomes. Okay. But what she showed in, in this study is that it was actually folks who were middle income, mm. who not because of access, but because they interfaced more with the realization that no matter how much money they make, et cetera, wow in their workspaces, constantly being reminded through microaggressions, they all accumulate and they have this chronic effect on our health. And therefore those individuals are more likely to have a higher risk for those chronic diseases. Mm. Mm. That's tough. Microaggressions yeah. are so real. We, you know, I do race work. I used to just do race workshops for teachers, but now I hold race trainings for um, weight for people in general who want to become anti-racist um yeah. and one of the ways we describe it is it's like paper cuts you know like right. nobody sees paper cuts but you they hurt right like people and you can have like a whole bunch of them um through just like in any given day because of the amount of microaggression uh, microaggressions that that you face as a person of color or as a black person specifically one of the things that that i just thought of when you were saying what you said in terms of serving on these committees listen Right. Like, that's what I did. I had to get out of the space. I'm like, I can't. I was taking days off and all my days off. I was going to another school to hold a workshop. Now, I was glad to do that because I'm feeling like I'm helping some black student at this school um, instead of my former place being uh, excited about that. Like they like the accolades um, that they mm. get from knowing I represented this place. That was helped. But then they talked to me about missing days. And I'm like, right. how does this make sense? I'm missing right. days because I'm representing you. But this, you know, so, but the microaggressions had up. But one of the things I think about us being all, on all these committees is that whiteness is a race. Like they forget that. They think that if it's something uh, dealing with race that they got to go get a black person. It's like, can you get yep. a white person up here too? Because yep. whiteness, whiteness is, is also um, a race. I'm going to read you one more thing that um, Resma Minikin said. He talks about how sometimes we also do it to ourselves with invisibility. He says, um, mm -hmm. the hearts, psyches, and souls of African-Americans have also been routinely attacked by another group, ourselves. Many African-Americans berate themselves and each other for being black, for being too black, for not being black enough, for being less than perfect, for simply existing and comparing ourselves um, and our bodies against you know, what's supposed to be out there. So you know, I thought about when he said that, I think that that's, you know, that's a thing, but I also will argue that we spend so much time um, with these questions, uh, so much time on these committees, so much time questioning um, to your point that you just made, like questioning the validity or reality of, of these microaggressions or trying to pr prove our worth um, that we sometimes lose ourselves and, and we make ourselves invisible um, I think that's a scary aspect too, because you can get so caught up that you forget who you were. You so caught up fighting this racism stuff that you lose pieces of yourself. Right, 100%. And, and as you speak on that, I think of Toni Morrison's quote that racism is the biggest distraction. It keeps you away from doing the work that you innately would be excellent and great at. Like, I think that I am a great advocate for anti-racism and social justice, but I do not believe that my people were put on this world to help people understand why we deserve to exist and thrive. I think that it's so frustrating because I feel like it's 
an extraction of our talents because mm -hmm. I think that if black folks were able to really be the amazing scientists and educators and creators. Creators, and I was gonna say, like you have that as one of your th three things, like you wanna create, but we, yes, 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 yes. Right, like if I can just sit here and just like, you know, make music and and be able to connect with, with I, I just feel like there's just so much potential that we have, but so much of it is expended through trying to justify our right to exist. And I don't think that that is what we should be doing. I don't think that that's what, she, what we should have to do. But I think naturally, if we don't do it, then you know, no one else is going to do it for us. And I think that um, that's, that's what's really on my mind as you say that. Yeah, I think that's the unfortunate truth. Like we don't want to always, we don't feel like we should have to, but then we feel like who else is going to? It's like a freaking tough spot yeah. to, to be in. Um, I want to ask you about um, why, why you think this is like, why are we invisible? Woo, I feel like there's, there's so many layers to that. Um, but I think, I think part of it is that black women are facing two challenging realities. And, and one is like this world of patriarchy and sexism. And then on top of that, we're dealing with racism. And even within our own community, there's a lot of patriarchy and sexism that hasn't been addressed. Colorism. And then within the context, yeah, right. Colorism, 100%. So I think that all of these isms play out within our own communities. And then yeah. on top of that, like if we think about the the, the images that are exported through the media and television of yeah. who black women are, right? Like growing up, I didn't play with black Barbie dolls. I'm so happy to see that like now there's shows on Nickelodeon where there's like a black girl who's like a doctor and, and like doing that. But those are images that we didn't get to see. And every right. time we did see black women, it was in a negative way. We were yeah. hypersexualized. And I think that the same images that white folks consume, black people consume them as well. Like we didn't have black, we didn't have band-aids. I didn't even know that band-aids were supposed to match the color of your skin. Listen, you know what I mean? People say, I've heard so many black people say that. I didn't know either. I did not know. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, it's really well, or the idea of a nude bra. I said, what? I, I had no clue that these things and, Listen. and that, <laughs> when my mom, well, I remember when I was little and my mama would like say she like sent me to the store. She's like, go inside and get me some stockings. And she would say, get nude. And I remember not necessarily thinking twice. Like I just thought, oh, this is just a color. But I didn't think at the time, why do they call it this color? You know what I mean? Like, why, what, why is this called nude? You know, but like, you know, anyway, yes. Yeah. Right. right? It's just so set up for not us. Right. 100%. And then I think then like if you look at how structural racism manifests it's like you see it in our neighborhoods like the lack of resources and how our like we have potholes and streets I'm thinking about you know Compton like where I spent most of my childhood and yeah. you start to internalize that and you think that well is my neighborhood a reflection of myself? And is, is this what I deserve? And if you go home to that every day and you see Beverly Hills looking different and the people that live in Beverly Hills look different from yourself, you start to internalize these messages that you are less than and you, don't, you aren't deserving of resources and access. Um, and I think even as a medical student, I have these reflections a lot because we learn a lot about statistics related to diabetes and hypertension and COVID-19. And black folks are always among the highest to get these diseases. Why are we at risk we, for everything? We're at risk for, right. And, and the way that they present it is like, oh, well, race is a risk factor, but no, racism is the risk factor because race is a social construct that you all have created. And I think yes. that if you don't dig deeper into that, you start thinking, well, dang, I think black folks, we're just, we're just prone to get it, get everything, you know, we're inherently damaged. And I think we, we oftentimes don't have the space or time to do this deep dive and to do the reading yeah. because we're so busy trying to fight oppression and to, and to, you know, through our day to day, do, yep. you know, be a mom and, and take care of family. So yep. I think that even having this conversation, I realize it as a huge privilege that I have the space to to understand these things and have the space and time to do this. But it's 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 like it's layers. It's like we could go all day talking about this. <laughs> we could. Yeah. I certainly I know I've heard, you know, when you say 
um, people inherently think, well, I guess it's just, you know, I'm just predisposed to be this way. I know I've heard those sorts of things where people think yep. that's just how it is. And, and I, I tell you, it was only sadly, maybe about three or four years ago that I learned about redlining. And it was mm. such a huge, like, it was such a weight lifted. Like, I felt like crying, like when they, you know, it was talking about how the GI bill only went to certain people. And, and if you're black, like you couldn't get a house. Um, and so all these white people and black people coming back from war, they were all poor. Um, these white people ain't have nothing, but they got money and we didn't. And it was just like this huge thing to think about. It's like, because I remember growing up and seeing people, maybe I even thought, you know, cause we didn't have a lot. And I was like, is it something wrong? Did we not work hard enough? It had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with not them working harder at all, but them being given this huge advantage. And so you get these thousands from this GI Bill and you get, and you're allowed to buy a house when black people weren't. And then you age out, you have kids. Now you get to take out equity on this house and this goes to put your kids through college. So now all this wealth keeps going. And meanwhile, black people had to just go live in like whatever public housing or whatever that whatever they could for all these years. And it's just like, it was so freeing for me to learn that and to realize, oh, this is how y'all got it. Like this, y'all ain't get it for yep. doing nothing extra. Um, and it, it, it's just stuff like that, that I think a lot of people don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that in the past, the that that has always been the case. Like black women have always been like the the center, like the epicenter of so many different social movements. Like even if we look at the civil rights movement, even if we look at the latest election and and how we look at Absolutely. how black women really showed up in Georgia. Absolutely. So you know, because we are among the lowest rung of folks in our country when it comes to like who has the most access to power yep. and where we fall on in the, the caste system, as Isabel Wil Wilkerson says, um, if Black women are able to be free, then everybody else, and once we're free, that means that everyone else has to be free because our freedom necessitates the freedom of everyone around us. And I know that's a quote from somebody somewhere who said that way better than I just did, but that's, that's really the key. And I think that the way that that's going to happen is we can't just have policies that are like, all right, you know, we're gonna have changes that benefit everybody. But I think that we really need to have policies that are specifically for uplifting black women. Like what, what kind of research is being done to explore like why black women are getting fibroids? What type of research is being done around maternal mortality? Like we need to address specific issues that affect black women because what ends up happening when we have everybody policies, black women get left behind. And black Absolutely. women are often the driving force who are like, yeah, like we, we always want better policies for everybody because we, we're the ones who are often suffering the worst from these challenges. But oftentimes the policies, like they, they don't come back and do the same for us. We, we put them in these positions in these high spaces, but they don't have our back. Yeah. So I think in order for black women to be liberated, we're gonna need people who really have black women's backs as much as black women have everybody else's backs. A hundred percent, thousand percent, right? And then they all can be liberated too. Yep. Thank uh, this you is the so key, y'all. Yeah. Don't play, liberate us. <laughs> right? And you can it's be liberated gonna, too. <laughs> it's only gonna benefit you. It's only gonna benefit you. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lash, for your time. Yes, of course. Um, I hey, and for this portion, I'm so honored to have with me Clarabelle, Jenny, Loyola, and Silvana. You guys, please, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Uh, yourselves. We'll start with Clarabelle. Hi, um, I'm Clarabelle. I am an Afro-Latina woman at the Harvard Graduate School of Education in the TIE program. Hi there, I'm Jenny Portillo. Uh, I am a first generation American daughter of Mexican and Guatemalan immigrants. Uh, I'm also at the Harvard Graduate School of Education uh, in the school leadership program. Hello, I'm Loyola Rankin. I am Navajo from Coyote Canyon, New Mexico. I am Meadow people born for the Mexican people. My grandfather was two rivers flow together and my paternal grandfather is Mexican. 
Uh, I am a first year student at Harvard Graduate School of Education uh, in the higher education program. Hey y'all, I am Silvana Rueda. My full name is Silvana Maria Rueda Gámez. I know it's a mouthful. Um, I am half generation American, which is another way of saying that I am an immigrant, but I came here when I was pretty young, I was about four. So I've kind of um, straddled both worlds. Um, I came, I come from Costa Rica. I'm of co both Costa Rican and Nicaraguan descent. Um, I identify as mixed race Latinx, and I'm also a graduate student in the technology innovation education program at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. So I wanted to speak to you uh, ladies because I wanted to speak to people of color, um, but who are not black people who may be partially black um, or may not be black at all, but who are not white and who still um, have thoughts and opinions and views on black women. I can go first. Um, I was thinking about this question and kind of where I'm at regionally in the US in here in the Southwest, you know, we do have a wide diversity of people, um, but very few black people in our population, which is really interesting um, in a lot of dynamics, uh, especially when you get into like the history of the Southwest and everything. Uh, but when I was thinking of this question about why does the erasure happen, I was thinking of my own personal experience, um, not only with black people, with, but with black women was in media. And, you know, growing up in the middle of nowhere, what we had was like TV and like movies. And just seeing the violence towards black women was very strong and perpetuated inside the industry. So anytime like growing up when I was a kid and like I'd see a black woman character, I'd be like, oh no, she's gonna get abused. Like something bad's gonna happen to her. And I think that that type of continuous violence that's seen on television and you know like and all these little minds from when you're young, um, it kind of gives, I guess, this sense of permission, which is very disgusting in a lot of ways. Um, and then dehumanizes in a lot of ways too, um, which is really, really gross. <laughs> I can't find another stronger word for that. Um, and, you know, I, I would think with like the influx of black artists who are talking about uh, representation, um, I still get a little bit of that erasure happening um, in different ways, of course, but with like Tyler Perry's work, with uh, the show Blackish, um, especially towards Bo, the mixed race uh, character, and just very silencing. Um, which is pretty interesting inside of the characters, but I'm, I'm definitely more of a person who's interested in like representation in mass media and how that teaches the general population of like how we can treat others. Um, but that's kind of where I would start was probably with like representation when I was like in the 90s. <laughs> you When you mentioned thinking about the media and you're like thinking of Bo and Blackish, do you mean with her role you think she'd have a bigger presence like she is a doctor she's head of this i mean she, she she's the mom of this huge family do you think she'd have more of a presence with that I, I i think it's not so much the presence because she does have such a strong character but she's constantly silenced by the characters around her her in-laws her um husband her children and just the way that they're she's openly disrespected for laughs and being like, oh, it's funny because we can disrespect this woman who's a doctor. And I was just like, you don't get that way by like being a pushover inside the medical field, let alone a black woman. So I generally just did not understand how these two could exist together. And I don't think it was like a representation on her as a character, um, but definitely how her family treated her was pretty egregious on, to me again. And I was just like, oh, coming from a matrilineal society, we don't treat our women that way. And it uh, was just, it's really hard for me to watch, honestly. And I kind of stopped watching after season one. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Um, one thing that question made me think about was a 
study that I read for a paper that I wrote in ethnic studies because I wrote about Black women and how I felt that there was an erasure of their of the history. And I ran into this um, article called Girlhood Interrupted, the Erasure of Black Girls' Childhood. And for me, that's where it stems. It stems from as children, Black women are just seen, Black girls are seen as less nurturing. They don't need protection. They need to be supported less. They're more independent or they know more about adult topics or sex. And it, it starts the study actually proved that it starts at the age of five. Between five and 14, Black girls are just getting their childhood taken away from them and just being perceived in society as kids that don't need protection or kids that are not allowed to make the same mistakes as other kids. And as an educator, for me, that that was very eye-opening because working in a school system with all students of color and Black girls, I saw some of these things happening to them, them going to the offices more than getting in trouble for being loud or for having sass or it's, it's almost like the essence of who Black women are is it's hard for other people to like understand. Thank you for that. That reminds me of something I've heard or read about Black girls being seen as little women instead of little girls. It's like there's this womanizing that happens starting early. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, Savannah or Jen, go ahead. Yeah, just as you were talking, Clarabelle, like I started thinking about like how, especially like during the election and whatnot, I'm sure we've all heard like, oh, black women are the real heroes, right? Or like black women are saving America or black women are so strong and how as much as it sounds like you're giving positive praise, it negates the amount of oppression and suffering that black women go through even within their own communities. Because I think that that's something that in different readings that, that, that I've done, I've noticed that like, you know, it's very clear to us that the black community is not monolithic either and that there is a lot of issue there around like traditional patriarchal black culture being oppressive to black women and and denying them their humanity and i think that that gets them transferred over into other communities where we learn to see black women as being so strong that they like don't need additional support or protection or to be elevated or uplifted because they've got this we you know they're strong they can do it without us um so that's like one thing that i've, I've been thinking about a lot and how even if we think it's like praise that we're giving, it's really an erasure and uh, and a lack of acknowledging what the circumstances are that many black women are living with and it, particularly in this country, but across the world as well. And then in thinking about like my own upbringing, I mean, colorism is, is a thing anywhere, right? But especially when I think about like messaging that I grew up with being, having a Mexican father and a Guatemalan mother, like, you know, they, they didn't really interact with any black people growing up in their countries. Like it just wasn't a thing that they were familiar with. And so my, their first exposure, you know, came when they came to this country and their understanding of who black people are in general, especially black women also to Leola's point comes from that media, right? And so if you're growing up watching, you know, I grew up watching lots of soap operas, all the telenovelas, right? Like you never see a black face, particularly a black woman's face in that. And I remember there was one black male actor who was cast in every black male role that there was. And I don't ever remember really seeing a black woman in any of that, right? And like growing up, not questioning that because I didn't know any different until I started to get older and realizing this is absolutely not reflective of the experience of, of anyone who's in, out in the real world. And two, like that it's deeply, a, a, a very deliberate, deeply ingrained bias that happens in, in media representations, particularly coming out of Latin American media um, and how even even let like even Mexican or Guatemalan people who are in these shows are tend to be the more European looking counterparts, right? It's gonna, it's not gonna be someone who looks like me. It's gonna be some light skinned, blonde, blue, blue eyed person who clearly has some colonial ancestry that happened there. And, and so I think that all of that mixed together definitely also contributes to the erasure of, of who black women are and what they endure and uh, in, in, in across different communities and groups for sure. Thanks Jenny. You know, um... I remember thinking about um, thinking about this memory of right after the election when uh, Eva Longoria, I don't know if you guys saw where she was just like, oh, you know, black women did great, but the real winners or whatever are Latina women. And then people were like, wait a minute, why? What are you talking about? First of all, that's not accurate in terms of like the voting numbers and like what happened percentage wise. <clears throat> it's like you're damned if you do and damned if you don't as a black woman, because, you know, to your point, um, that like what what black women did with the election is incredible and then 
it people can perceive it as well they don't need help they they're so strong they can do all these things and it's just like it's like that's not the point it's like you know and then after after that you want to get um you still want your respect you still want to make um suggestions and demands you want and and then people are like well you know slow down it's like no i shouldn't have to slow down because this is what i should get um and then the evil longoria thing makes it people sometimes i think forget that like the real like that white supremacy is the real uh, enemy and not like people of color disagreeing and arguing and such um but so just to your point about that like i wonder how much of that too you know thinking about the media <clears throat> and who is seen and not seen in other countries and what people think about the roles of black women and stuff so you think about all those things thank you so much Silvana. Um, I'm snapping for so many reasons. Um, so when I think of when I think of kind of the erasure, um, the invisibilizing of Black women in particular, I think of this like intersection of colonialism, white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism. Like I think of so many different intersections that just converge at this point that's so dehumanizing and dangerous. Um, I say that because I really believe that this erasure is a global phenomenon. It happens in so many different communities across the world. Anti-Blackness, anti-Black racism is a global phenomenon. Speaking for kind of my, you know, speaking from like my geographical vantage point and from like my heritage and ancestry, there is so much, like Jenny was saying earlier, um, there's so much anti-Black racism in Central America. There's so much anti-Black racism in Costa Rica, in Nicaragua, in my ancestral homelands. Um, there is so, that erasure stems from such an early age. That erasure happens when you learn about the history of, you know, when I think about, for example, like my cousins, my family members, myself learning about the history of Costa Rica when we were younger, like black people were erased from history there starting very, very early on, which is, you know, really like, I don't know if I can swear, can I swear? Is that okay? You can say no, <laughs> cause I swear a lot. Anyways. Um, it's just, I, it's I so suspect that adults, I don't expect that kids will be watching this, but you know, do what you gotta do. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Oh my God. Thank you. Anyways, what I was going to say is that it's so fucked up, right? Like it's, it's some, um, it's some fuck shit. Um, it's, I see this line between erasure and like this, like pendulum swinging between erasure, erasing, invisibilizing and exoticizing and fetishizing. Like I also see a lot of fetishizing, again, across communities, across cultures of black women, black culture, but especially black women in particular. Um, I feel like the answer to that erasure is not what so many white women and non-black non -black women of color turn to, which is like, oh my God, let's, let's, let's fetishize. Let's, you know, try to imitate or try to like, you know, like put on a pedestal in a way that is so unbelievably also plays into that same kind of just a different angle and a different, um, just a different side of racism and just a different side of white supremacy. So I, yeah, I feel like that's, it's a big question. I don't necessarily have, there's so many different angles and so many different ways to answer it, but that's yeah, it is interesting that, um, that black women can be seen and not seen at the same time. You know, it's like this fetish thing. It's like, I, which is so many different angles that I'm thinking about when I'm thinking of fetishizing, I'm thinking all the way back to slavery where, you know, black women or black people in general weren't really people, you know, this three fifths thing, but we, if we want to have sex with you, so what are you having sex with it? And if it's not a person, you know, it's like, what is this? And then that needs to be kept quiet, I guess. But like, you're, it's, it is a complicated one. And I don't even know, like the fetishizing, elaborate just a little bit on what you mean. Yeah. So what I mean when I say fetishizing, I mean, like, what I think of is like, for example, like white women who are just so obsessed with black women that they're, that they participate in black fishing or that they are so, you know, are like, they themselves feel like they, they start co-opting parts of, um, 
parts of black culture, but specifically parts of black female culture culture. They start Did you say black fishing? Black fishing. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know that term. Yeah. So and anyone else can can jump in here um, because I can explain it kind of from my again from my vantage point, but I'd love to hear what others um, how others define it and what others think. So I understand the term black fishing to mean like a non-black person, including a white person, non-black person of color, essentially co-opting aspects of black culture to the point where they make them like to the point where it's like 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 the Rachel Dolezal effect, for example. Like that's an example of black fishing, right? Like, or somebody wearing braids who's not and in a way that is very clearly co-opting braids and very clearly kind of like, you know, like it's like cultural theft, basically. So again, it's this line. So that's like, that's how I understand black fishing. It's, I see so much of that when with like woke, progressive, white, well-meaning white people who are just so, again, they participate in this, they participate in this exoticization. They participate in this, like, it feel you know, in this, in this total fetishizing of black culture um, and of black women. Got it. Gotcha. Gotcha. I would throw in there just like the entire Kardashian family. <laughs> I don't know if you need to edit that part out because of like lawsuits or anything, but if you look at those girls, I'm like, you're, you're white. Like, I don't understand this, like cake on makeup to make yourself like more dark skinned. And then also the body modifications that tends to happen um, through that family's like history um, and co-opting that blackness as it were. Gotcha. Again, not a monolith. <laughs> right, 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 right. There's aspect, There's times when we're when it's time to be monolithic because they put us in a group like voting and stuff like that. But then there's times where we're not like, I got you though. Yeah, Clara Bell, sorry. No, no, that's fine. Um, I was just going to add on to that when um, Silvana was talking. It made me think about recently my own experience with um, Ivy Park. I happen to be a real huge Beyonce fan. And I went on her Instagram and there was these two women that, were not her Instagram, Ivy Park's Instagram. And there were just two women that were just full out black fishing. Like they're from Russia, but they had like big hair. Um, they, they were like makeup to make them look ultra brown. But when you go look at these women's profiles, their whole entire feed is just all of this appropriation and black fishing. And that's like, that's the problem right there. Like we, black women are not monolith. We're not like, you know, in some ways, it's, kind of, it's very disrespectful because it makes it seem like most of us are just one type of identity and we're, and we're not. But it's, it just it really frustrated me because I was so upset that whoever was marketing her social media, Ivy Park's brand, like you should have known better, but clearly they didn't. Thanks for that. I also, that it's, that, that it's like, Again, it's erasing us by replacing us. Is that what they're trying to like? We're trying to replace. You know what I mean? It's like you're gonna do all that, but you're not necessarily other than Beyonce. You're not going to promote black women. Then you know, like if you're gonna do that, we shouldn't. But then, like, where are all the other black women that you have all over your website? Then, like, show the range of us, or like, you know, that we are somebody that you aspire to be like, or something. But it's like just taking the pieces and not giving attribution or got it. So it's like the ultimate cultural appropriation, it sounds like. Well, yeah, and yeah, I think, oh, sorry, Loyal, go ahead. I, I just wanted to throw in there too, it's not just like physical aspects too, but also like language and culture. I'm thinking particularly the gay culture um, and how it co-ops a lot of the language, the slang and, you know, how fast things become like cultural icons. And then all of a sudden they're co-opted into like whiteness um, you know, having to explain where self-care comes from and like what that actually means. Um, that also ties into that black fishing too, I think. Um, but yeah, go ahead, Jenny. Yeah, just building on what all of you have said, like also thinking about that, it, like the things that are being chosen to appropriate are the things that black women are so often persecuted for. Like, especially when I think about hair and how much like 
not, it's not just that you're putting on braids. It's not just that you're, you're taking something that is not culturally yours and not acknowledging what it came from, but you're also putting on something that a black woman is not getting a job for, uh, something that black students are not being allowed to graduate for. Right. And so it's like this, this erasure and this negation of the very existence of things that make black women and black people's lives harder. Um, and I think that that's the part that infuriates me when it comes to, the, I didn't even know it was called black fishing, but at the minute that I, I, I was going to type in uh, Silvana when you were explaining that, like, you mean like Rachel Dalzal? Cause that's who I was thinking of when you were saying it. But then it also brings up, you know, people like I looked up the term just now and there are all these other people that are also getting accused of that as well. Like, you know, when Ariana Grande like presents herself as like looking a lot darker than she actually is where you have to question like, is she ethnically ambiguous? And it's like, no, she's not. She's just making herself look that way. Or it, when it comes to language or even intonation, right? Like we're thinking about Iggy Azalea and how if I heard her on the radio that I would not assume that she's this white woman from Australia and how messed up that is, right? Like. Um, and just it just speaks to the point that it is like a worldwide phenomenon that there's this desire to co-op the things that black women do and acknowledge how great they are, but not when they come from black women. And 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 like when black women do the things that are that that everyone wants to elevate, it suddenly becomes a reason to persecute and to deny them access to things that they are absolutely entitled to, like any human being is. And I think that that's what I struggle with with all of this. It's it's not just a oops, like it was a misstep or a faux pas. It's like, no, it's, it speaks to a very real void that exists when it comes to acknowledging the humanity of, of, of black women and, and all of the things that, that make their lives so much more difficult. I appreciate all of the, um, thoughts. You guys are great. You're bringing, um, some great perspectives. I really appreciate that. What you just said, Jenny, made me think about butts for sure, because black people were too fat, right? We were just like too big and too curvy. And then people who aren't, you know, white people essentially just, you know, or the Brazilian butt lifter, you know, this thing that, you know, the injections. And I'm like, I thought butts were bad. And, and then making it seem like it's, I mean, that's certainly a Kardashian thing when people want a sort of a Kardashian body. And it's, there was just this period where it's like, there was this emphasis on other people for curves and it's like you know black women had curves for a long time so um thank you so much there's a, a prominent navajo singer uh redmilda cody um who is half navajo half black um and she has a documentary out called becoming redmilda uh, where she talks about her experience growing up half Black, half Navajo on the Navajo Nation and just the amount of racism that she encountered from the Navajo people and like how that shaped her story um, and um, what that experience has been like for her. And it's, it's a really powerful documentary um, to me because, you know, having grown up on the Navajo Nation and like, unfortunately participated <laughs> in some of the racial segregations that happened. And you know, you're a child, you don't know until like, you're like, oh shit, that was actually really fucked up. <laughs> um, and, you know, just being more aware of her story as a black woman, as a Navajo woman, and that, she doesn't have to give up one to be the other and that she can exist and be happy and be successful and be all these things that she wants to be. Um, and also go buy her album, <laughs> follow her on Instagram. She's doing a lot of really amazing things for our nation and our communities. Um, but how that leads to the liberation of all of us, right? I mean, just watching someone be who they are and love what they love and create what they can create. I think that is just like the best thing. Um, not the only thing, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but for sure, um, really That's great artist. When I think of the process of centering black women, I think of like starting from a place of critical reflection, starting from a place of like first kind of looking inwards and saying, hey, what are the relationships that I have with black women. How do black, what roles do I like expect black women to play in my life? What are in the workplace, for example, we can start there. 
um, like in schools, in education, in academia, whatever the work you're kind of the workplace that you're coming from, what roles, what like what are the black women that I am who are the black women that I interact with? Um, what roles are they playing? Are if there is, for example, a couple if there are a couple of black women in the nonprofit that I work at and they are consistently being asked to book the conference rooms or to do the administrative work, which is a true story. Like I have seen that many times. Um, what do I, like, what is, what is that about? What do I do in those moments? How do I participate in that, benefit from that, push back against that, challenge that? I think that is an incredibly important place to start, that place of kind of internal self-reflection, because it illuminates a lot of, it can illuminate a path forward. It can if I don't engage in a process of critical self-reflection, I sometimes then, and I think that this is true, I'm using I statements, but I think that this is just like a universal truth across the board that there are sometimes that we then part like participate in the same systems that we're trying to dismantle and perpetuate the same systems that we're trying to dismantle without that process of inward reflection first. So I feel like that for me is a really important that's an important starting point when it comes to centering black women. Thank you. I, I wrote down participate, benefit, push back. I think that's critical to, you know, for people to ask themselves, how am I participating? How am I benefiting? How can I push back? Thank you for that. Clarabelle. In the power of pushing back, um, Loyola actually reminded me of uh, an event that I went to at Harvard and I watched this documentary called Jamaica y Tamarindo. And it was about Afro traditions in Mexico. And I think what's really important about centering black women is having these stories told because black women are not monoliths. And these experiences being on the forefront, these documentaries, uh, the people making them, those stories are super, super important in terms of pushing back and, and centering the narrative to a more, to more tell our stories. And, I, I like, when I think about centering, I also think a lot about healing. When like you talk about self-care and where that comes from, I think that black women have a whole essential, like other, like a more deeper need for when we, we talk about healing. And I think, I think people need to not like use healing for capitalism purposes. If we're gonna, if we're gonna do healing in our communities and if we, we really want to center black women everyone needs to heal, but we also need to understand that certain sets of groups of people have a specific like way that they need to be healing. Thank you for that, um, Carabelle. I also, I, I'm appreciative of you guys because I feel like I was thinking about um, centering black women um, or the liberation being like, they did something, they did this, they helped lead something like the Montgomery bus boycott. And then they revamped the, um, the bus system, like when it was over, it was almost bankrupt. And then not only did that save the business, um, the boycott in, in the end saved the business, but it also like made the buses possible for everybody. You know, I was thinking, but I hadn't thought about these, these other pieces. So thank you for adding these other ways to center and like how they can be helpful. Appreciate that. Jenny. I'm thinking a lot about in like just the practice of interrogating things that are put in front of us and taken for granted sort of statements. Like, I think about it particularly when it comes to things like what ends up online, right? And thinking about how I had to have conversations with people about, you know, this idea of, you know, uh, of black women being heroes and being so strong and whatever, and like having this conversation. And frankly, it's something I've had to confront for myself because, you know, like the great thing about the internet is it never lets you forget. And so I saw like, you know, a Facebook post of mine from four years ago that said, you know, black women are the real heroes here. And at the time I thought that what I was saying was, you know, was an affirming statement. And now I realize like, well, why is the onus on them to have to like save this, you know, save this country from itself to some degree. And like, what am I really saying when I, when I speak to the power and the strength of black women. Right. And so I think that there's this interrogation that has to happen, both of the things that we say, but also of the things that people around us say about black women and to black women. 
Um, because if we don't start like kind of with that critical interrogation, you can't really get the conversation started, right? Because everyone needs to be on the same page around what do we mean when we're saying these things and what do we not mean when we say these things? And not just what do we think we mean, but how is it being, how is it impacting others? And like interrogating that intent versus impact of when people say things like this. So I think that's like one thing. And then the second thing I'm thinking about is that, you know, uh, is this push for not just having these nice conversations about interrogation, but what are, what within your specific field, your specific locus of control, can you do to help elevate the the you know the voices of Black women and making sure that they're not being lumped together as a monolith and thinking about what you know li like listening, yes, but also speaking up and making sure that that you are giving that place to black women as as they want it you know not assuming oh i need to like speak for you but also i can't i don't want to let you do all the talking either like actually listen to black women in your life and listen to what is it that they want and they're looking for because i think that if we make the assumption that you know we either have to compl step completely aside or completely step in front of a black woman we're going to continue making the same mistakes and it comes down to each individual person is different each community has a different struggle and so the first thing that that we as as non-Black people of color can do is start by interrogating and listening and then moving forward from there with intention. Thank you so much. I was thinking about um, the what you said, the first part about um, what you your post from four years ago and the Black women are heroes. I think it could be both and though, though not entirely either or. Um, I think both and. I think there probably are lots of Black women and men or people who would like to see black women are heroes um still but it probably it could be nice if there's like a sentence after that you know a, a, like an addition that doesn't mean they still don't need support or something like that exactly. so, acknowledging the the humanity there, not just like this this kind of abstract uplifting that we're doing right 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 no. right listen to um, black women i was at a work a conference one it's like a day-long conference and the speaker i cannot remember her name um she does a lot of like diversity, like stuff in different schools, but her sign, her closing sign was this sign that somebody had from like a, um, a crowd or, or like a pro, I don't know, but it said, listen to black women. And she put that up for like most of her speech. And so, so I appreciate that because then people will know what the needs are and know. And it's also like, there's this group of people who've had you know, how Kimberly Crenshaw talks about intersectionality, like oppression for being a woman, oppression for being black and all these setbacks and all these things is a kind of the, the best kind of person to learn from, in my opinion, like somebody who's 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 had to go through a lot like that. Those, those are the sorts of people who end up being like, you know, really good teachers. So especially like I'm thinking about black women in this country. Um, and yes, I was gonna, yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only on top of like listening to black women, but for sure, like relearning how we listen to black women because we are conditioned to not and even though we're like i'm an ally and you know i'm a friend and like i have black friends you know all the other like dismissive things we make in our lives of like no i am listening i'm like but are you hearing anything <laughs> like what are you actually doing and the other part of that too i think is also like reconditioning like your body's responses because one thing i've learned in like the movie example I gave is like seeing a black woman like I immediately like oh my gosh she's gonna get hurt something bad's gonna happen to her and you know having that body's reaction to be like okay no you know you can watch like Black Panther and like the black women aren't gonna get hurt they're they can fight they, they got themselves but even just like reconditioning our bodies and like how that on like uh, in I'm not what's the word, not instinctual, um, a programmed level, I guess, of living in America, right? And, and other countries too that are anti-Black. Um, because I know I hear a lot of people being like, well, I am listening. I'm like, but are you hearing anything? <laughs> Read the room. Like, this is obviously not working for them. So you need to stop and just get on their side. Even if you don't completely understand, be like, nope, I'm just going to back you and I'll learn along the way. <laughs> That's fantastic back you and learn along the way um thank you Loyola thank you Jenny thank you Clarabel. thank you Silvana thank you so much for adding you guys just added so much to to my project and I really appreciate it so thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of this thanks for having us yeah thank, thank you for you. having us uh, yeah. man 
I'll begin concluding by sharing my reflections. The findings and revelations were quite interesting. There were a host of reasons offered for why black women are erased. The erasure itself a process in direct contradiction to results that mean the greater good for society. We heard time and again that it's highly beneficial of greater good for the masses when black women are not only not erased, but are in fact centered. To call the benefits meaningful is an understatement. Plus, they're far-reaching, going way beyond impacting the group of black women itself. Jonathan mentioned being trained from early on not to notice black women. Such training is commonplace. No black women in the physical form until high school, while concurrently not even in the literary form. From the personal to the broad, Reverend Gamber pointed out ways she and others could personally benefit from relationships with black women, while Echo Yanka noted black women's fight for affirmative action caused many white women and others to reap lasting results big time. A theme coming out of the Women of Color group was that black women's traits, characteristics, and such are desirable, as long as they don't come from black women. Life doesn't work like that. Besides, the whole of us together is worth much more than the sum of our parts. Perhaps people are missing the greatness that is black women because of what Lash noted about black women having so much potential in the form of philosophers, scientists, architects, artists, lyricists, inventors, designers, creative creators, thought leaders, problem solvers, that was my parenthetical, potential that gets expended, as Lash said, out here justifying our right to exist. I think of my own hurtful experience in this area, mostly in workplace settings, the erasure in the form of coworkers ignoring, dismissing, minimizing, or times when I decided to talk to an administrator about the unacceptable treatment and erasure toward me or a different black woman, only to have said administrator side with her fellow white woman, claiming an inability to think of any ways to address it. This would leave me going from shock to confusion to code switching so much to fit the dominant norm that I'd be complicit in erasing myself, effectively a prop in the play Collins mentioned, until choosing to use my voice. Let's go back to Collins. She writes, One day, an amazing thing happened on stage. The props began to move. The uppity ones had the nerve to occupy center stage, pushing the star out of the limelight. Some props that had been waiting in the wings to make cameo appearances stormed the stage and refused to leave. The stage became increasingly crowded by an array of props, many of which saw one another for the first time. You might imagine the star's response to this topsy-turvy disruption of tradition. He was dumbfounded. It was almost as if the chair that you're sitting on now yelled, get your behind off of me and ran out of the room. Wouldn't you be shocked if an object that you completely took for granted, a prop that made your life comfortable, turned out to be a living, breathing being with free will that did not bend to your own? She asks us readers to please note that the story of the day the props began to move describes the politics of doing intellectual work, not simply the ideas themselves. She said she wrote Black Feminist Thought not simply as an academic project or something done because it was chic to do. Instead, it's her experience as an African-American woman. Being treated as a prop is not simply a convenient metaphor. For me, she writes, as is the case for many other African-American women, myself included, and all the others treated as props. This treatment has tangible, palpable effects. She lists some, but for me, there's physical um, and emotional toils. So she brings it present day. There is no scripted ending to this story because it is our story in the making. Individually and collectively, we are all involved in writing the next chapter in this drama, each from a different vantage point. Individual black women resisted their place as objectified props and aimed to tell their own stories. I encourage each of you to write, edit, and rewrite your own stories until they ring true for you. You know, treating black women as if they are disposable has been a detriment to society, leaving it stagnantly spinning its wheels, often aimlessly, until it's ready to center black women again. This is cretinous, fatuous, inane, stupid. Until society is ready to realize this, or unless maybe it never will, listeners, you can start by centering black women. This reminds me of a story Stacey Abrams shared of having such high grades she and other high school students from Georgia were invited to the governor's mansion. Only the guard on the grounds let other families enter, but told hers the event was not for them. He doubled down, wouldn't even check the list for her name until Stacy's dad was unrelenting in his request. Stacey Abrams said she has no memories of meeting the governor that day, but has vivid memories of that incident. It was an erasure attempt. She didn't let it keep her down. We know how this story ends, right? She ultimately ran for that office, ending up just shy of occupying that house. And even when she didn't, she registered nearly 1 million new voters to impact positions like that of governor and likely who guards the grounds. She decided she wouldn't be erased. Again, listeners, 
center black women. If you're a black woman listening, we can start intentionally centering each other or loving and centering ourselves. Hashtag us too. Some lashes on and some lies. 